Today's message is titled, I wish I would have passed through. I wish I would have passed through. That's going to make sense to you as we dive into this. But, you know, I was thinking about life and how life is full of specific seasons. I was on this kick where I went to Starbucks for a while, and every morning I tend to eat the same thing. And they had this little thing. It was called strawberry grains. And I was, like, hooked on this stuff, man. Strawberry grains, and I'd get my coffee. And one day I'm in the drive-thru and I order it with confidence because, man, that's what I want. And the girl goes, hey, I'm really sorry. Uh, I got bad news. Uh, We don't have strawberry greens anymore. That was seasonal. And I was like, what? Come on, man. No strawberry greens. And I'm going to tell you, even to this day, I still go through there and occasionally I'm looking on the thing. Are they back? Are they back? Well, I'm going to tell you, that was a long season. They haven't come back and it's been about a year, but I'm waiting for them. But the point I'm trying to make is that life is has seasons, and sometimes there's things that are seasonal that we need to see. In Ecclesiastes 3, one, it says this. It says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Here's the dilemma that we find is that although there's a season for everything, the dilemma, the dilemma is that sometimes we can get stuck in a season, that we can make permanent something that God intended to be temporary. You know, the children of Israel, this is what happened to them, that God speaks to Moses and he says, my people have been in bondage for decades and I'm picking you, I'm speaking to you and I want you to go there and I want you to deliver them. As he delivers them, of course, I'll save you the whole story. You can look up, look that up for yourself. But this journey, when he finally delivers them, he makes a promise to them. And that season was supposed to be what scholars believe 11 days, but they made it 40 years. I want you to see in Exodus 3.17, it says this, And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and Anklebites, in case I add that in there, a land flowing with milk and honey. I want you to see that he made a promise to them, that he was calling them up out of something. And that's why I've titled this message, I wish I would have passed through. That some of us, God is calling you to pass through seasons. He's called you to a place that is temporary, but because of our attitudes, because of our mindsets, we may have that old Israelite mindset when they were slaves. We have that mindset and what it's done is it's locked us into a place that we shouldn't have been permanently. And Israel got stuck in a season, and there's a reason for it. And I think that we can learn from them. There's a few things. One is that they did not believe God's word and his promises. They didn't believe God's word and his promises. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 11, it says this. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? I think that sometimes we we give the Israelites a hard time, the children of Israel, and we beat up on them and say, man, like if I would have experienced that, then man, I would have for sure believed God. I would have had no doubt. I mean, come on. Their enemies were coming behind them and the sea split open as Moses touched the waters and and all of a sudden as they get through on dry land that the water just swallows up their enemies. For sure, I would have never forgot God at that point. I would have no reason to doubt. But I think in reality, when we look at our own lives, that some of us, that we open the mill and you get something that says delinquent notice and fear grips your heart instantly. And you instantly forget about all of the times that God miraculously came through for you financially. That you sit before a doctor and all of a sudden the doctor's like, hey, well, listen, this isn't looking good. And fear grips your heart. It chases faith out of your heart. And you're like, oh my gosh, like what's going to happen? Am I going to die from this? Oh man, are my kids going to have to raise themselves? Oh, what about my husband? What about my wife? Listen. And fear grips your heart. And I think that we're no different in many ways. That we find ourselves getting stuck in seasons because we forget about what God has said. We forget about the promises that he's made. And it'll cause you to be in a season where you just absolutely come to a screeching halt. The other reason that that they found themselves stuck in a season is that they grumbled and they complained against the Lord. Numbers chapter 14 Verse 26 and 29 says this, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. 
In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. What he's saying is you're going to die there. You're stuck. You're not moving through. You're not passing through. You're, you're going you're gonna to finish your life there. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me. And I think that we need to take heed when we look at these words. Do we remember the promises of God? That he's working all things together for good to, the, to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do you remember that the Lord has said, Fear not, for I am with you. Do we remember the promises that God has given, that he's got a plan and a purpose for your life? Do we remember what he's spoken, but also do we allow complaining and grumbling to enter our hearts? Do we utter words that actually are in opposition to what God has done and what he's wanting to do? Because you can get stuck in a season that is not God's best for you if you're not careful. I can get stuck in a season if I'm not careful. But you know what's amazing is that even when we're unfaithful and even when we don't keep our end of the deal, that God always keeps his word. That when we're unfaithful, God is faithful. When we're unkind, God is still kind. When we lack self-control, God is always stable. And I think about how good he is because even when they made that mistake, they grumbled, they complained, and there were consequences to it. What was the consequences? They got stuck. They didn't pass through. They wished that they would have passed through, but instead they chose a different route. They chose to do something differently. But I think about how good God is and how kind he is and that he took care of his people. He had a plan. And here in the wilderness, he introduces this thing called manna. It was bread from heaven. It was their sustenance in that time. It was the very thing that kept them alive. But it was something that was meant to be temporary, and they made it permanent. Through grumbling and complaining, Israel parked in a place that they were supposed to pass through. Let me ask you today, my friend, are you parked in a place that you were supposed to pass through? Are you in a relationship or a group, a friend circle that was meant to be temporary, but now you've made it permanent? Are you in a financial place? Are you making decisions financially that maybe it was for a season that was supposed to be temporary, but now you've made it permanent? These are, this is, these are questions that only you can answer. But here's the reality, and this is how good God is, that even in that place of being stuck, it was still a place of miracles for Israel. That's how good he was. See, what you may not realize is that in the wilderness, God brought manna, which was supernatural food to keep them sustained. He led them through the wilderness by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. That in those times that there were venomous vipers that came into their camp and people were dying and he made a way. There was a snake that was on, on a stake and he, and he put it in the middle of the camp. He instructed Moses to do it. And if they would just look at it, they didn't have to go touch it. They didn't have to do anything. If they just looked at it, they would be healed. That was a miracle. But you know what's interesting is that some people refused to. That God provided a way for them. He provided miracles, but they still chose to doubt. They still chose to do things their own way. Do you realize that it was a place of miracles that God, he provided water for them out of rocks? Come on, that's crazy. It was a place of miracles. But this is what you must understand today, my friend, is that just because you're experiencing a miracle doesn't mean that you're experiencing God's best for your life. That just because you're experiencing a miracle doesn't mean that you are experiencing God's best for your life. How do we know this? Because in Joshua chapter 5, verse 12, as they moved out of the wilderness into the promised land, the time that they set foot on the destination that he promised them, it says the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Canaan was the promised land. I want you to understand that God is moving us to specific places through specific seasons, and you don't want to get stuck in a manna season. See, God will sustain you. God will take care of you. God's grace will cover some of your mistakes and, and the, the mishaps and, and all of the missing God. He, listen, he's, he's full of grace, and he's also full of truth, and God has a plan for you and I, but you don't want to get stuck in this season where you're constantly Man, I need a miracle. I need a check in the mail. I need this to happen. I need that to happen. That God has a plan. There is a better way. 
And some of us, we're stuck in relationships that we shouldn't be in. We're stuck in situations that we shouldn't be in. We're distant from God when we could be close to him. And let me just remind you today, church, don't park in a place that you're supposed to be passing through because there's a better way. Even though God takes care of us sometimes, let me just simply tell you that some of you are not living and experiencing God's best for you. You're just bumping along. You're barely making it through. Your marriage is hanging on by a thread. Let me tell you, there's more for you. Some of you, you're bumping along financially. No savings account. Year after year, it's like you're just scrapping by week after week. Just barely, barely making it. Let me simply tell you this, that God is a God that blesses his people. And he wanted to bless them. Because let me remind you of this, that God didn't promise them manna. He promised them a land flowing with milk and honey. And in the same way, some of you are living far below the standard of what God has promised you. God has locked dreams in some of your hearts. God has spoken things to you when you were a child, and you're not living those things yet. And if you're not living in the fullness of what God has promised you, you're not there yet. And could it simply be that you're stuck in a season because of grumbling and complaining? You're stuck in a season because you are not believing God and believing the promises. Let me tell you guys, there's a difference between believing in God and believing God. There are a lot of Christians that believe in God. I believe in God. He's some cosmic force out there, kind of like Star Wars. It's the force, like, yeah, he's all powerful. You believe that he exists, but you don't believe that he can do what he said he can do. And there's a difference in that. And that's where I'm hoping to challenge you today to step out of that season of just barely getting by, just barely hanging on because God has great things for you. Does anybody believe this today? You guys awake, you guys with me? So I have three things that I want to share with you in the next 15 minutes. And it's this, and, and, and this is in hopes of, of moving forward, being unstuck, being free to engage with what God has for us. See, God stopped the manna, and it was for a specific reason. And let me simply say this to you today, church, that moving into the promised land, it takes preparation. Preparation of the heart, preparation of the mind. There's preparation that has to happen for you to be able to step into it. And so the first thing is this, is that we move from manna to maturity. Manna to maturity. See, God wants all of us, he wants his people to be mature. And see, the manna, it took little effort to collect. It took little effort to prepare. The manna was given to them six days a week. Then they collected on the sixth day a double portion for their day of rest. But they would just wake up, and it's just everywhere. They just go out there, oh, this is easy. You just pick it up, and you collect it, you go, and you eat it. But it takes maturity when you move past manna. And there's a lot of people that are believing for a miracle. They'll pray for a miracle. And they're just, it's like, a, like we're just, you know, hucking it up there. Man, Hail Mary passed. Whew. Just, man, God, I need a financial miracle because we spent all of our money. We weren't mature with it. God, I, I, need, a, I need a miracle in my marriage because we just can't control our mouths and we just cuss each other out all day. God, I need a miracle because I just lost my job because I can't get along with anybody. God, I need a miracle. Do you realize that many of you, that, that the reason that you're in the season you're in is because you're believing for a miracle, but you're unwilling to change. You're unwilling to mature. And there's a lot of people that will pray, and this is what it looks like in Christianity most times, is, God, I need you to change my situation. But rarely do we pray, God, would you change me? You see, the difference is that God needs to mature us if we're going to walk in the provision and in the place of the promised land that he has given us. And this is one of the things I want to encourage you with, because every step that you move forward with Christ, because that's really the only way that we can change for good, is that it has to be a change that's motivated by him, empowered by him, and that your maturity in Christ makes you a walking miracle. Do you realize that? How many of you guys in here would admit to having a past? Anybody? Come on. I think everybody should have their hand up in this place. We've all had a past. And I think that many times we underestimate the power of the changes that Christ has made in us. 
That when our friends or family members who judged us in the past for the things that we had done, when they run into us now and they see that Christ has changed our lives, they may not even be able to believe that it's true. But listen, that when Christ matures you, when we give him permission and we walk lock and step with the Spirit of God, you start making changes that blow people away. That you become a walking miracle, a walking billboard, a reflector of God's goodness, his ways. That before you lost your cool, you wanted to throw hands and fight everybody. Now all of a sudden you got self-control, you're patient, you're kind with your words. You're like, who is this guy? You know, Listen, God has the ability to change you so much so that everywhere you go, you're a reflection of him. That is miraculous, my friend. And that's something to give him praise over this morning. Come on. So in 2 Peter 3.18, it says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Ephesians 4.15 says this, But speaking the truth in love, what may grow up in all, come on, let's say it together, one, two, three, all things into him who is the head, Christ. We are the body, he is the head. There is a growing up. There is a maturing that God desires from each and every one of us. And why is this so significant? And why was it significant for the children of Israel? Is that the promised land comes with milk and honey. And although both of those are a blessing, let me just simply say this, that milk comes with manure and honey comes with bee stings. And how we handle the manure and stings of life reflects our level of maturity. Do you realize that God had to grow the children of Israel up? He had to get them to a place where they can trust and have faith that God was on their side. That even while they were working their way out of the wilderness, he started staging little battles for them, battles that they could win. So they had confidence in God. They started to believe in themselves that they could be a great nation, that they could be everything that he said that they could be. And I believe for you, it's the same thing, that as you begin to mature, your attitude begins to change. Your mindset begins to change. You're out of Egypt, but now it's God's getting the Egypt out of you. And you're able to perceive things in a godly manner. There's a maturity and an authority that you carry in Christ. And you handle the manure of life. You handle the stings of life appropriately. And as we're moving and as we're maturing, Here's the thing that I want you to understand is that some people you have not passed through. You've actually been stuck in a season and it's been to your own detriment. And it's a horrible place to be when you're stuck in what God used to do and it's keeping you from what God wants to do now. And there are so many people that are stuck in something that, well, I used to do it this way, or this is just the way that I do it, or this is the way I've always done it. This is my attitude. These are my spending habits. These are my sleeping habits. These, these, these are my, my, this is how I enjoy my hobbies. This is how I do ministry. This is how I read the Bible. And everything is, is, is not, not subject to God's will. It's subject to our own. And let me simply say this to you. Don't be like the Israelites stuck in that season. For them, what was the season? They were stuck in a manna season. We just collect manna. That's all we do. If I'm hungry, we just collect manna. We collect manna. We collect manna. That, they, they were stuck in a manna season. But God had more for them. And let me tell you today, my friend, God has more for you. You know what's interesting, and this is just an interesting point for some of you who are Bible scholars out there, that the manna was the provision for the Israelites in the wilderness. But you know what's beautiful? Is that Jesus, one of the first things that he did in Matthew chapter 4, it's also in Luke chapter 4, is that when he was baptized, comes up out of the water, behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It says that the Spirit led him out into the wilderness to be tempted in all ways. You know what's amazing? That Jesus conquered the wilderness. He conquered the wilderness and so I want you to get this today, is that the Israelites had their manna. That was their supernatural provision. But Jesus says in John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Do you realize that in your wilderness today that he is the bread of life? He is the one that sustains you. He is the one that is going to get you out if you allow him to. He's what you need in order to get unstuck. He's what you need today to be free of being stuck in the manna season, in the wilderness. And so outside of Christ, there is no maturity, my friend. There is no maturity outside of Christ. 
Yeah, you can put on the face and, oh, I'm educated and I got this. Hey, I'm not against that. But the reality is this, is that Christ is the only one that can forgive sins. He's the only one that can heal you and make you whole inside, in your mind, your will, and your emotions. He is the only one that can allow you to produce permanent change. And so he is our bread of life. He is the one that sustains us in the wilderness and moves us to the promised land. Here's the second thing today is that we move from manna to maturity, but we also move from manna to management. Let me just say this, that the promised land will require work. It'll require effort. It's going to require more faith. The promised land is going to require that you learn to manage the things that God has given you to steward. See, this is not a popular message with most people, especially when it comes to faith. Well, I'm just going to call on God for a miracle. I'm just going to call on God for manna. But listen, you're, you're past the manna season. God is calling you into the promised land. And there's different responsibilities. See, the Israelites, their responsibility was, oh, we're just going to pick up this stuff. And then eventually they complained about that. And then God had to give them quail because they were tired of the manna. But all they wanted to do is they wanted to live in a way where they were just, it was just a cheap, easy way. But to be in the promised land, to live in the land that flows with milk and honey, it was going to require some work and responsibility on their part. They were now going to have to take care of the cattle. They were going to have to take care of the sheep. They were going to have to plant seed in the ground. They were going to have to water that seed. They were going to have to harvest those things. They were going to have to buy or make clothes. Can you guys see that? It was a different season that required management. It required responsibility. Look in Deuteronomy 8.4. It says this, your clothes, when they were wandering in the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. That is a miracle. That is manna for them. But let me remind you that God didn't promise them indestructible clothing. He promised them a land that flows with milk and honey, my friend. In the same way that God's not just, if you're just trying to get by with the miracle all the time, trying to get by with the miracle, I'm not against that. But the point that I'm trying to make is that you must mature in the things of Christ and then begin to steward and manage the things that he's given you. If he's led you into the promised land where you're, man, I always had a dream of owning a business. And now that you're here, if you don't manage the business well, you're not going to have a business, my friend. Well, I always wanted a family. Well, if you don't manage your family well, you're not going to have a a family for very long, my friend. You're not going to have a marriage. Are you guys getting what I'm saying here? Is that it requires that when you step into that place, it requires something of you. That when we said yes to God that we were going to plant Hub City Church, man, we had to get out there and raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. When we said we're going to plant a church, we had to raise a team and find and believe and ask God. We had to do something. It required something different. I was no longer just a church attendee. I had to do something different. And I'm going to say this to you today. What is the dream that God has locked in there? What is the promise that he's given you? Whatever it is, it's going to require management. But listen, with his power, you can do it. Pastor Joe, if I can get you up, that'd be great. And here's the third and final thing, is that we move from manna to movement. That was funny, I said move. Manna to movement. Deuteronomy 1.8, this was God's word. He says, see, I've given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land. The Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. What's your next move today, my friend? What's your next move? That the promised land not only requires that you mature and that you manage it, but it requires that you move toward it. What is it that God has spoken to you that you've forgotten about or you stop believing for? Because it's like, I prayed for that and it just didn't happen. I prayed for a supernatural healing and it didn't happen. I, I, I pray that, that, that I would be successful in business and it hasn't happened yet. I, I prayed that I would finish this or that or I would start this. And some of you, you're stuck today in a wilderness season. You're stuck today in a manna season, just believing and, and you know, it's like, man, like I just hope something will change. But I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna take a step of faith. It's not just believing in God, it's believing God. It's not just believing that he can, it's believing that he will. It's a season of faith for some of you. 
You've got to take a step of faith. Can I challenge you and speak the truth to you? I'm going to do it whether you want it or not. Hub City is a restoration church. There's an anointing on us and this church, this house, for people to get free, to get healed, and to be whole. And there are far too many people that I've experienced in my 40-some years of following Jesus from the time I was a kid that brings me to this day. And some of you have been hurt. You've been wounded in church. You've been wounded in the home. You were betrayed, neglected, abandoned. I don't know what the situation is. But your first step is you need to get healthy and you need to get whole in Jesus Christ. If Christ has made a way for you to be forgiven, but also to forgive, and you choose not to, let me be bold. You're living in the wilderness on purpose. Some of your first step is to learn how to let the past be the past and to really get healed and move forward. And if you choose to stay stuck, you will know from this day forward that that is a choice. It's not something that happened to you. Jesus came to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. And this is your choice. You will either step toward it or you'll resist it. And I feel this so strongly. This wasn't said in last service, but I feel this so strongly today that some of you, this is your first step. That You have to make a choice that God, I'm gonna move towards healing. No more excuses, no more excuses. That pastor hurt me. Man, my dad this, my dad that. Listen, that if you are a born again believer, you have a new father. You've been adopted into a new family and that you truly can be healed. We can't hide behind what somebody else has done when Christ has made a way for you to be free. We can no longer use that as, as an excuse or as a point to grumble, a point to complain. We must take responsibility. God, would you grow me up? God, would you heal me? God, would you renew my mind according to your word? God, God, would you teach me how to manage the things that you're putting before me? God, because I just want to honor you. I want to steward the things well. God, I, I just today, I'm afraid. I don't know if I could take that step to forgive my mom. I don't know if I could take that step to, to forgive my ex. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know. Listen. You can and you will if you'll step into faith. Come on. Some of you don't know how close you are right now to actually living in victory over depression. You don't know how close you are to living in victory over anxiety. You don't know how close you are. Why? Because if you'll just simply reach out to God and reach toward him, his hand is right there, my friend. He'll grab your hand and he'll pull you close. But when we spend so much time resisting him and making excuses as to why he didn't come through last time and I prayed and it never happened and I don't know if I believe and, and I'm deconstructing my faith right now and all these things. Listen, let that stuff go and take a step that, that it's gonna require movement on your part. And I promise you this, that as you enter into that promised land, what is the promised land? It's different for all of us. It represents what he's promised you. Some of you have longed to have a family that is healthy and that you've moved past the dysfunction that you were raised in. Christ can give you that. Some of you have been battling chronic illnesses and you're just, you're tired. God can heal you. Got living proof sitting on the front row. Some of you, you feel like your marriage is beyond repair. It's not beyond repair. You just stick Christ in the middle of it and do what he says and make that your pursuit. It can be restored. It can be better than you ever thought imaginable. It'll blow your mind. You feel like you're teenagers again. But will you make a move? Will you make a move? The choice is yours, my friend.